This presentation is going to cover solving the surface energy balance equation to estimate transpiration and evaporation. And this is uh, leading us into more broader models on estimating evapotranspiration from crops and vegetation. So our outline is going to be how do we estimate water loss by evaporation and transpiration using the surface energy balance concept combined with the aerodynamic transport equations, things that we've already covered in the past. So we're going to put those two things together to form a way to calculate water loss from different surfaces uh, using weather data and characteristics of the surface. We're going to talk about the importance of surface temperature when solving the energy balance. We're going to do a bare soil example, a leaf example, and um, then show you an Excel model that solves the leaf energy balance for you that you can use to simulate water stress or the effect of different weather conditions. So we've already talked about the surface energy balance. This is just a quick review. We've got uh, Rn minus G equals H plus Le or Rn is net radiation, G is soil heat flux. Those two things together represent available energy and then that energy is used to either heat the air or in the form, in the form of sensible heat, H, or evaporate water in the terms of latent heat. And we know that that ha equation has to balance by conservation of energy and on the right there you see the famous drawing by Dr. Tanner that was in his 1960 paper. Now, we also know that we can describe the transport of water and heat from the surface using an aerodynamic transport equation like you see here where we use our surface resistance models where sensible heat's dependent on the temperature difference between the surface and the bulk air while latent heat is dependent on the difference in vapor pressure of that at the surface uh, minus that in the air. On the sensible heat equation, the aerodynamic resistance uh, governs the rate of flux, whereas in the latent heat flux case, we have to consider both the aerodynamic resistance and the surface resistance, which is you know, different depending on which system you're working with. If it's the leaf, it's just the stomatal resistance. If it's the soil, it's the effect of the soil crust. If it's a whole field, it's a combined impact of the soil and the vegetation uh, like you see in the diagram here on the right. So again this is review so if we take our energy balance equation and we substitute in the aerodynamic equations on the right hand side we get what you see here. And um, we call this a combination model and sometimes you know you hear people talk about ET models as a combination equation or a combination model. This is what they mean that they've combined the energy balance idea with the aerodynamic transport concept. Now what complicates this term is you have a nonlinear term there. Remember that that parameter that circled here is the saturation vapor pressure at the surface temperature so that's you know, a nonlinear equation. So just remembering we can take our Teton's equation. This is the form proposed by Murray here. Uh, there in the middle, saturation vapor pressure as a function of temperature. And we can substitute that in to our formula and we have the finally get the formula there on the bottom. And um, so that's kind of a real basic energy balance combination equation and we could try to solve that right now. We really need to solve for surface temperature that you can see appears in three different locations here in the equation. And unfortunately, you know, if we could solve for surface temperature, then it would be possible to, to solve the full equation. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a closed form solution for surface temperature as shown here. So we have a bit of an issue in solving this equation. Um, we know every variable in this equation except the surface temperature. 
So it'd be convenient to solve for surface temperature using algebra and then calculate ET using the latent heat flux equation. That is, you could use the top equation that we're showing here to solve the surface energy balance, find the unique value of TS that satisfies this equation. Then we could plug that uh, number back into the latent heat flux equation. As you see down there in the middle, and presto, we've got the latent heat flux or the ET from the system. Get the evaporation. Uh, like I said though, there's no algebraic solution for TS, so we have to solve it numerically. This is, there's lots of ways to do that uh, with a computer. Um, and, um, but the problem is this gets even more complicated when you start adding in um, some of the other terms. And it makes it just a little bit more challenging. For example, we could add in the impact of atmospheric stability, right? There's a fairly complicated approach to getting that aerodynamic resistance, RA. So you see there in the middle is the equation for RA. I have it listed as RHA, but you can just think of it as RA. And we see it's a function of wind speed, U there, that makes sense, and the von Karman's constant, but then and the function of roughness length and displacement height, as well as atmospheric stability. That's what those terms are on the very, uh, in the right hand side there of the, of the square brackets. And that's where you have to use the Mon and Abakov length, right? to solve for that. So, and that's a function of sensible heat flux, H, which is also a function of surface temperature. So, um, you get this more complicated form here where um, uh, there's a, just a lot of terms in there. We can continue moving along that route and create, also add in the equations for net radiation and soil heat flux that have the surface temperature in them, right? So there on the top, we remember that net radiation is the absorbed short wave plus the absorbed long wave minus the emitted long wave. There it is on the top. And then we also know that we can approximate soil heat flux G um, using Fourier's law. And I just use a dis dis uh, discretized form there on the right hand side. So if we know the thermal conductivity of the soil material, we know the surface temperature and then some temperature just below the surface, T sub Z, we could solve for soil heat flux. And we can substitute those back into our equation now. And here's what we finally get for a combination equation for energy balance of a bare soil, for example. Um, where we don't have to deal with the vegetation and the soil separately. So here you see net radiation minus soil heat flux. That's what's on the topmost por portion of the equation. And then on the bottom, you see the two aerodynamic terms, sensible heat flux and then latent heat flux. So now we have a surface temperature appearing in four locations. And um, you can see them there. And uh, in every single term, there's a surface temperature in the net radiation term, soil heat flux term, sensible heat flux term, and appears twice in the um, latent heat flux term. And then we also know that surface temperature appears in those uh, stability correction terms. So it's a very complicated solution, so now you definitely need a numerical solution. You cannot solve this with algebra. Not only numerical, but iterative. And um, also remember that you have your surface resistance term over here in the um, latent heat flux equation, RS, right? That's one of the ter most terms with some of the one of the biggest impacts mathematically but also the um, something where there's a lot of uncertainty right we don't know what that surface resistance is you know it's, it's very hard to determine um, although very important so if you know you're thinking about your bare soil case it's like what's the surface resistance of a field like this, right? So we know there's moisture down there below the surface. 
but that moisture has to diffuse through a drier soil, soil layer before getting to the surface, maybe even through some residue before um, it can move into the upper atmosphere. So different scientists have studied that over time. Um, this is a well-known paper that I referenced down there from 1994. And you can see that, you know, they were trying to model the surface resistance of the soil um, using sort of a very physics-based approach looking at what happens as the soil moisture moves through the soil matrix and eventually evaporates and, and moves up into the atmosphere. So, you know, you could have a, you could have a bunch of lectures alone on just this topic, but I wanted to expose you to at least a few ideas that people are kicking around there. And this is what they often find is that the soil surface resistance can be modeled as a function of near surface water content. And obviously this is very soils dependent. You get completely different curves for a sand versus a clay, for example. But it just shows you a nice example where if you know the soil moisture content in the zero to one centimeter range, you can get the surface resistance, okay, for this particular soil. So we know as the soil dries down, right, that the surface resistance increases, right? The soils are kind of often kind of self-mulching, right? We've all seen that. A soil look have a dark, wet color, and then all of a sudden it shifts and becomes light-colored as it dries. And that's that resistance layer increasing and reducing evaporation. There's been more contemporary papers on that same topic. This is from um, uh, 2018, looking at the soil texture effects on the surface resistance. It's a really nice paper uh, if you're interested in this topic to get out there and, and see if you can um, better understand how, how soil properties affect that soil surface resistance. Uh, another classic energy balance example is the energy balance of a single leaf. It's another place where we can apply the exact same principle. Okay, a little bit different equations, but the same idea. So we know the, the leaf has an energy balance just like the field. And here I just made a really simple model where um, we have a leaf. We know there's the energy balance is Rn. It has to equal H plus Le. We know something about the stomatal conductance, the optical properties, and the size of that leaf. Um, if we know that and the weather data, we can model the energy balance and ultimately get the transpiration rate from the leaf. You can see there that I'm modeling the net radiation, sensible heat flux, and latent heat flux. Now in this case, I'm assuming a hypostomatous leaf, so the stomata are only on one side. And um, I'm ignoring cuticular resistance to water loss. And I'm, not ex and I'm assuming there's no net exchange of radiation on the underside of the leaf. So um, we're going to assume net radiation and latent heat flux only occur, is mainly controlled by a proper processes on the single side while sensible heat flux can occur from both sides. So you know remember your models of a think about the the stomatal cavity there's wa liquid water down there inside the mesophyll cells they're at the leaf temperature they convert to vapor and then diffuse out of the stomata. So you know think about a soybean leaf like this right up on the top of the canopy um, that's kind of what we're modeling on this real simplified approach. And some of the physics and equations that I'm going to use are out of Chapter 7 from the Campbell and Norman textbook. So um, if you're interested in that, uh, go review that uh, book and that chapter, and it'll show you some of the uh, formula that I'm using here. So net radiation... Um, can be modeled for a leaf just like we can for a field and that it's the absorbed short wave plus the absorbed long wave minus the emitted long wave. Now for the leaf, um, you know, part of the radiation is absorbed, part of it's reflected and part of it's transmitted. So instead of using an albedo like we would for the field, we have to model it as one minus the reflectance minus the transmittance, right? So um, we take the global irradiance and multiply it by that term, and that gives us our absorbed short wave. 
And then the emitted, uh, the absorbed long wave and the emitted long wave are modeled just like they are for the field, right? Uh, the Stefan Boltzmann equation there, you see it in both forms. Remember that we also have to model the emissivity of the sky in this case. Uh, again, this is for a leaf right at the top of the canopy where one side is fully exposed to the atmosphere. Sensible heat flux, okay. Here I'm modeling it like we're used to seeing, except I'm using a conductance instead of a resistance. Should feel very comfortable moving back and forth between conductance and resistance, remembering one's just the reciprocal of the other. I'm also gonna do it in units of moles per meter squared per second. This is more common in plant physiology. You know, uh, micrometeorologists or an atmospheric scientist might use resistance in seconds per meter but physiologists tend to work more in moles per meter squared per second, and that's what I'm doing here. Um, and then you can model the conductance of a leaf, the aerodynamic conductance of the leaf, uh, as a function of leaf size and uh, wind speed. Okay, and there's some physics laid out in the textbook on that. So uh, we use something that D term is called the characteristic dimension. It's about 0.7 times the lit width of the leaf, okay? So these are very empirical equations, but are good to help us um, move forward just sort of exploring this idea. Latent heat flux, again, is modeled in a real similar fashion where, um, again, uh, I'm using a conductance instead of a resistance, but it's the exact same idea. And um, in this case, the conductance is both a function of the still model conductance as well as the um, uh, aerodynamic conductance. And uh, reminding us, you know, that if we've got two conductors in parallel, then we model the total conductance to water vapor flux uh, as follows. And um, you can see um, some examples of how still model conductance responds to leaf water potential or extractable soil water down there below. Again, we can model the aerodynamic resistance for water vapor using the wind speed right at the leaf and its characteristic dimension. So it's important to remember that leaf size affects the conductance, okay? So um, as the leaf gets larger, the conductance goes down, the aerodynamic conductance goes down because that there's a thicker layer of air forming on the leaf surface that the water or heat has to pass through. So just like we did for the bare soil case, now we can substitute um, our aerodynamic functions into the right-hand side of the, of the uh, energy balance equation and substitute our definition of net radiation of a leaf into the left-hand side. Um, and you can see the, the final result there. And we can see that leaf temperature appears in four locations in that equation, again, in every single term. So like before, there's no algebraic solution for leaf temperature, so we have to solve it numerically. So what I did for you was um, I just made a really simple, where I took the math that we just um, went over and incorporated it into a little Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. And what you see here is in the is a uh, on the along the left hand side you see the different variables. Um, up at the top you see global irradiance. That's how much sunlight we're getting. The air temperature, the vapor pressure, the wind speed. That's you, and then the elevation. And you can see that then in the those are all in the yellow box. And the green box is where you put in your properties of the leaf. Uh, the shortwave radiation absorptance, the emissivity, the leaf width, and the um, still model conductance, GS, right? So basically in this model, you can change any of the parameters in the yellow box and in the green box, and then it's going to calculate everything else. Also notice that there's a case one and a case two. Now this is very common in modeling, right? We have some kind of base simulation that we hold constant, and then we vary case number two, right? So, for example, here I've got them both set identical. Case one and case two are identical. That is, the yellow boxes 
and the green boxes are identical. So we should get the identical results and we see that we do. Especially if you look down in the kind of um, little bit of a maroony reddish box, you see that um, it simulates the leaf temperature is 30.96. Okay, that's that was where the numerical solution was. And I used uh, the Microsoft Excel solver to do that. And so if you, in your version of Microsoft Excel, you will need to install the solver to make this work. And uh, you can see once it solved for the surface temperature, then it calculated the net radiation and the sensible heat flux and the latent heat flux. And that balance there uh, is how close the model got to zero, right? You want that to be really close to zero, and you can see that it was in this case, which is great. And then it finally there at the very bottom, it calculates the transpiration in millimeters over like a 12-hour period, right? So if you converted that to a depth of water like an, like an irrigator would do. So what you do, and then, oh, I forgot to mention there on the right-hand side, you see um, graphs of the leaf temperature and the leaf energy balance. Okay, and you can see everything's identical for both case one and case two. And, um, and you see first in the upper graph, it compares leaf temperature to air temperature. In this case, the leaf is just a little bit warmer than the, than the air. And uh, if we look down at the energy balance, we can see that most of the energy is going into latent heat flux with a little bit of energy going into sensible heat. Now, so what you do is, if you're sitting here looking at it, this is how it should appear when you first start the model on your computer. Let's say you want to change this to model conductance, that variable that's in the red box. So you either want to simulate a, a more well-watered situation or you want to simulate a water-stressed situation. So what you would do is go into that green box and change in case two, you change it to something else, hit the return key. It's important once you change a variable in that green or yellow box, you hit the return key afterwards. That will change the variable. And then you press control T to rerun the simulation. You can see a little help box down there at the bottom. Press control T to solve the energy balance. And then that will show you the effect of the change that you made. So here's an example um, where I changed the stomatal conductance from 0.4 to 0.04, see, for case two. And so now case one is our, what we call our base simulation, and case two is a water stressed simulation. And if we go all the way down to leaf temperature, you can see that in the base simulation, it was 30.96, but the temperature went up to 33.54 for the water stress leaf, which is what we would expect, right? We close those stomates, uh, we can't evaporate water as fast, and we um, the leaf heats up, right? And that's what you see there in the graph. Now the leaf is significantly warmer than the air, three and a half degrees warmer. And if we look down at the energy balance, we can see now that in case two, sensible heat's a lot more important and latent heat is small. So a big swing there in how the energy was partitioned because of that stomatal conductance change. Again, remember, once you type in 0 0.04, hit the return key, and then hit control T to re-execute the simulation. Over on the left-hand side, you can see um, a graph I made where I changed the stomatal conductance and plotted uh, leaf temperature. So as the conductance increases, which would be like it getting more and more water, um, the leaf temperature drops. As conductance decreases, this would be like more st water stress, leaf temperature increases just like you would expect. You can see it's a little curvilinear, uh, which would be hard to deduce any other way than by running these simulations. Here's another case where I took it the opposite direction. So now you see my case two stomatal conductance has been changed to one, okay? So this is an extremely well-watered leaf, maybe right after irrigation. And you can see that now leaf temperature in case one was still our base simulation of 30.96 degrees, but the leaf temperature dropped now to 29.15. And if you look at the graphs, now the leaf temperature is less than air temperature. 
if leaf temperature is less than air temperature, it's going to absorb sensible heat as air flows over it, right? So the air is at 30, leaf's at 29.15. As air flows over, it's going to transfer energy. So if you look down at the energy balance now, you can see that case 2 is actually absorbing sensible heat from the air. See how H is negative? And we're getting a huge amount of latent heat flux uh, over on the right-hand side. So, and you, you know, one thing that's interesting with, as you change the stomatal conductance, you don't have a very big effect on net radiation because it just has this teeny effect on, on leaf temperature, which affects the long wave term. So net radiation is kind of insensitive to these factors, whereas H and LE are super sensitive. Uh, note that you could, you know, calculate a Bowen ratio for the leaf, just like you do for the field, which would be really sensitive right to these kinds of changes. So this is how you use the surface energy balance model. You can play all kinds of games where you change the environment, change leaf properties, and see how it affects the surface energy balance and crop water use. Notice um, there at the very bottom in the blue um, square that in this last particular test run, case two, that transpiration's gone all the way up to 6.3 millimeters for over a 12 hour period, right? So a huge, huge, over 50% increase there. So um, shows you how all these things interact, right? So this is a really important concept in micrometeorology that you change one thing, right? You change either a weather parameter or a leaf property, it'll affect all the other parameters calculated down here below pretty much, right? So, um, there's all this interaction and in a relationship among different variables. So that's important. And the other key thing to remember is that the surface temperature of any object, right, is dependent on the surface energy balance. That's what was shown in all this math. So the surface temperature of any object is a function of its energy balance, right? And that's not only true for crops and soils, but everything else, okay, on the surface of the planet. So, um, it's an important concept to grasp. Uh, if you want to learn, if you want to experiment with the uh, XL surface uh, or XL leaf energy balance model, you need to install the solver in your version of XL to use the model. And I made a link to a YouTube channel there that shows you how to install solver. Uh, that just installs it. You don't really have to learn how to use it, but you do need to have it installed to run that spreadsheet. You'll also, if you want to just better understand how to use Solver, if you haven't used it before, uh, I linked to a YouTube video there that sort of explains how to use the Solver tool to find the root of an equation. So that's where I'm going to wrap up this presentation and sets us up for one final presentation on the penman monteith equation and calculating reference crop ET. And those models are founded on the principles that we just went over in this presentation.